Happy Father's Day. Isn't this an awesome day? I mean, we finally got some moisture and everything. Usually, for Pentecost season, we're in Pentecost season. Yesterday, or last Sunday was what we call Pentecost Sunday. It's when we celebrate the birth of the church. We start putting up red around, so you see the red pyramids everywhere. And so we, for the next uh, few weeks, we will be celebrating the, uh, the church season, Pentecost. And, and usually when we look at the Pentecost season, we tell the story of Pentecost found in Acts chapter 2. The believers are gathered, you remember the story, right? The believers are gathered there and the Holy Spirit swept into the house like, like a mighty wind and there's little tongues of fire shooting up and resting on each of them and they began to proclaim the good news in every language under heaven, it says. They're going wild and crazy. That's usually the story we tell, but there's another Pentecost story in John's Gospel. And it didn't happen 50 days after, Pentec- after Easter Sunday. So I guess, really it's not a Pentecost story, but it's the same story. It's God working at a different time. But actually, this story starts on the afternoon of Easter. That first Easter Sunday. And so today we're concluding our Lifted Up sermon series by turning to uh, John chapter 20. We were 21 last week. I just couldn't help but put Peter in on on uh, on Pentecost Sunday itself. But so we're going to go back a chapter and go back to chapter 20 of, of John. And we're going to see about the, we're going to hear the story of how Jesus came and stood among his followers and lifted them from fear to courage, from doubt to belief. The question is, though, is where were the disciples on that first Easter Sunday? Where were they? Were they they out looking for Jesus? No. Were they teaching people the things that Jesus had taught them? No. No. Were they healing the sick and ministering to the poor like Jesus said? No. Where were the disciples on the first Easter Sunday? They were locked behind closed doors because they feared the Jews. Fear imprisoned them. The doubt that they had about the real resurrection of Jesus paralyzed them. And the despair that had come from the fact they had lost the one that they had put all their hopes, all their dreams in, the one who they thought for sure must be God, and now he's dead. The despair from that grabbed a hold of them. And so in the Gospel of John, when you read through the Gospel of John, For long, painstaking chapters in John's Gospel, Jesus has been preparing His disciples for His departure. He's been getting them ready. He's gone over and over again the commandments to love one another, to be bold, to trust Him, to be the branches to His vine, to feed on the bread of life, which is Him, to be ready to follow Him at all costs. But apparently someone, and more than someone, wasn't paying attention. You look at the picture of the early church, this picture of the early church, quivering behind locked doors, and you think to yourself, you call this the church? But then, something happened. Something happened. You know what happened? Jesus happened. Jesus happened. So let's begin with John chapter 20, verse 19, and we'll go through the end of the chapter in our reading today. Here we go. It was still the first day of the week. This is the Easter Sunday, the first, the day of the resurrection. And that evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jews, the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. The risen Christ slips through closed doors appears before these despondent disciples and they don't know Him. Think about that. He's been with them, but they don't know Him. He speaks to them. He says, peace be with you. And they still don't know Him. Let's let's continue. See how it says. Verse 20. 
after, he's, after Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his side. See the next line. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. He showed them his scars, then and only then. They saw that it was Jesus, and they rejoiced. Somehow here, a connection is being made between the belief in the risen Christ, the risen Jesus Christ, and the scars that are in Jesus' hands and His side. Being raised from the dead did not erase his scars. The Jesus Christ of Easter bears the scars that were made on Good Friday. Jesus' disciples recognized him as risen only by touching his scars. Now think about this. Here's Easter. This stunning triumph of God. There's this victory over death and the defeat of all those things that sin controls in our life. All of that. This magnificent Easter story and it does not erase the scars. The risen Christ bore nail prints in His hands or His wrists. That's how knew this, they knew that this mysterious one who stood before them was none other than their own Jesus, their Lord, their God. I want us to understand this today. The Christian faith, believing in Christ and following Christ, the Christian faith does not deny the pain. It does not deny the reality of the wounds that we suffer. Our Christian faith does not deny the existence of the scars in our lives. Rather, our faith enables us to go on in the name of Christ, even with wounds. But there are still the scars. The risen Christ was known by His wounds. Let's continue the story. Verse 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. This is what happened on that 50th day to the whole crowd. The Holy Spirit comes and is with them. But what happens in this moment is that Jesus lifts up His disciples. He's with them. He breathes on them Christ and the Holy Spirit and He lifts them up. He lifts them from despair to hope. He lifts them from doubt to believe. He dis lifts them up from fear to courage. And so this, in my mind, is John's picture of Pentecost. It's quiet. It's gentle. The Holy Spirit comes with a breath rather than this mighty rushing wind. This is John's Gospel. Now, remember John's Gospel if you and I hope you are part of a small group and you will study John at some point. This is a wonderful book, wonderful one of the Gospels. But in John's Gospel, he wants us to remember this, the rush, the wind, the breath. The very Spirit of God who swept over the chaos and brought the world into existence. Go back to John 1.1. 1, 1. The Word was God and the Word was with God. You remember that? See, John wants us to remember that God breathed breath, the breath of life, into Adam and Eve. And so Jesus breathes new life into His disciples and gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower them to continue His ministry. Here's 
Here's something. Jesus fills you with this Holy Spirit. And He sends you out to minister to people. Let me repeat that line because that may be the most important line I say today. Jesus fills you with His Holy Spirit and sends you out into the world to minister to people. So the question is, how does God want you to minister to people? How? He sends you to offer forgiveness to people in His name. Yet we all need forgiveness. And when we offer forgiveness in Jesus' name, then God can start cleaning up and working on people. That's not our job. Okay? Our job is to offer forgiveness in Jesus' name. When we've done wrong and we've confessed our sins to God, we need to hear the powerful words, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. So we need to hear those. Sometimes we use those words when we serve Holy Communion here at the church. And they're powerful words when you get to give them and receive them. And we all need that. We all need forgiveness. But can you imagine what it was like on that day all the fear that had gone on since Friday and Jesus was crucified and, and then you have two days of, of nothing. You know, there's all Saturday and then and, and Sunday you just, there's nothing going on and then finally you start hearing some things. Can you imagine what it was like to be there on that day that Jesus showed them His scars? I bet it was awesome. Don't you wish you could have been there? You know, I bet Thomas wish, wishes he could have been there, Right? I mean, we're going to talk about Thomas for the next few minutes, okay? Because Thomas was not there. The disciples were gathered, but Thomas was not there. All right, let's go on to the the passage in verse 24. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Thomas before we... Uh, jump on Thomas too much. Thomas was very committed to following Jesus. As a matter of fact, the first time we see Thomas in the Gospel of John is when when Lazarus is dying. Jesus hears that Lazarus is dying, and so I'm um, go to uh, to John chapter eleven. And in John chapter eleven, Jesus said to his disciples, "Let's return to Judea again." And the disciples replied, "This is the disciples replied, Rabbi." The Jewish opposition wants to stone you, but you want to go back? You go down to verse 16. And then Thomas, the one who's called Didymus, the same Thomas, said to the other disciples, let us go too, so that we may die with Jesus. Thomas was the first of the apostles, the disciples, the twelve, to express that kind of commitment to Jesus. But Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared to his disciples and showed them his scars and breathed unto them the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't know where Thomas was. We don't know. I mean, I always, you know, kind of, you know, I don't know where Thomas was. But Thomas was somewhere else. Maybe he was being a good dad. You know, maybe... He was coaching his son's little league game and helping his son go undefeated in his little league game. That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it, Cameron? If you, you, did, you did that, right? And your dad was right there with you, right? Isn't that cool? Maybe that was what Thomas was doing. Is it really more spiritual to be holed up in the church building or wherever they were at, the doors locked, scared to death? Thomas wasn't there. Let's go on to verse 25 of our passage today. The other disciples told him, okay, so so, um, uh, Jesus appeared and and then it's about a week later. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger in the wound, he by the left by the nails and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. 
Thomas has doubts. And you know, honestly, history has not been kind to Thomas, right? I mean, everyone wants to call him. See, we all know that one. We all know the doubting Thomas thing. But no one ever, no one, none of them believed in the resurrection at first. I mean, not one of Jesus' disciples believed until they experienced in person the risen Lord. Actually, if you go to the Gospel of Mark in, in chapter 16, that sums it up. So everyone doubted. Mary Magdalene, the closest three, you know, the three big ones, Peter, James, and John. <coughs> Pardon me. You know, Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene saw the empty tomb and she still didn't believe until Jesus spoke to her, appeared to her and spoke to her directly and says, Mary. And then she recognizes. She runs back. She tells the disciples, all of them, all of them were there except for Thomas. She goes back and tells them and they won't believe until Jesus shows up, stands in the midst of them, goes into those locked, closed doors somehow. He gets past them and he shows them his hands and his feet, then they believe. And we wish we could have been there on that Easter evening and had that breath of Jesus blow into the, us the Holy Spirit that would change our world and change the world for 2,000 years as it has. I mean, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be awesome to be a part of that group? But we're absent like Thomas, right? Thomas did not make it out to the cemetery early that morning with Mary. Nor was he in the room behind locked doors with, his, with, with the disciples. And let's be honest, for many of us, seeing is believing. We have those engineering minds. We have those, those uh, scientist minds. And, and it just, we got to see to believe sometimes. But I think for all of us who missed Easter, that first Easter, we should take note. Now, there's some of us here today who like some of the disciples were there from the beginning. And like Mary Magdalene was, and, and you've seen the Lord. In, in your life, you know, you've been there, you knew the Christian faith. I, I knew the Christian faith. I never knew a time as a child that I did not believe in Jesus. I was raised in church. It was just a part of my life. It was the go-to thing was to believe because that's the way I was raised. You know, and, and, and for people like me, some of you are the same. You know, when you hear the word faith or belief, you don't think about difficult doctrines or esoteric theories. You know, what I think about was that kindly, and I thought she was ancient at the time, and we called her old to her back, but we always called her Sister Elam. I never knew her first name. We called her Sister Elam in our church. And she was that little old lady that taught us Sunday school. And she taught those Bible stories and brought them to such life in our minds that we really believed. We knew it happened the way she taught it. Maybe for some of us here, it was when we started going to youth camp and our youth director took us to church camp each, each summer and, and you know we sang and we prayed and we committed our life to Jesus Christ anew each summer. That's an awesome time. And, and maybe some of you were there early, but that's not what Thomas was. Thomas was late getting to the party. And sometimes some of us are there. Some of us may have been in church a good part of our life, but we still have trouble with believing because it just doesn't come natural. Thomas needed to touch. Unless I touch. And you know, do you expect Jesus when, when Thomas says, you know, unless I touch your, his hands and, and stick my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe you know, do you almost half expect Jesus to kind of sock it to Thomas and give him a good reaming for not believing? You know, do you kind of expect Jesus to say, tough luck, Thomas, you should have been here. I came, you were gone. You were playing baseball or whatever. But that's not what Jesus says. 
Let's continue the passage. Verse 26. After eight days, Jesus' disciples were again in a house and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered. Again, the doors were locked. Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, he goes directly to Thomas this time. He said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. You need proof? You think that seeing is believing? Touch, see, look, you're good. What I see in this story is that Jesus gives us what we need. See, we don't all learn the same, right? Some things are more powerful for different ones of us. If you think seeing is believing, Jesus says touch, see, believe. Jesus gives us what we need. You know, I think it's interesting that we're not told in this passage that, that Thomas actually took him up on the offer, that he actually touched his hand and stuck his hand in his side. We don't see that. Now, let's continue. Let's, but let's look what Thomas did. The next verse, verse 28. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, Thomas made one of the strongest declarations of faith that's recorded in all of the New Testament. My Lord and my God. The highest Christology you can get if you're into those kind of things, those, all that. My Lord and my God. And let's go on verse 29. Jesus said to him, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. And I suppose when he said that, he was busy blessing many of us. Because most of us were not there that first Easter Sunday morning. It's a couple of thousand years, and some of us are not as young as we used to be, but that's pushing it, right? We weren't there. Some of you have, but some of us have not seen the empty tomb. Maybe some of you have, but many of us have not physically seen the risen Christ for ourselves. But yet you have believed. Blessings on you, Jesus says. You are blessed because you believe without seeing. Now, Jesus does give Thomas what he needs. John says that that's the way Jesus handles doubt. He gives us what we need. Matter of fact, let's finish this chapter. Let's finish the last two verses here, verse, starting with verse 30. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in His disciples' presence. Signs that aren't recorded in this scroll, but these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in His name. These things are written. The story of Jesus and Thomas, the Gospel of John, all this is written so that you and I can believe. John says that Jesus did many post-Easter signs and miracles. Even more spectacular than walking through closed doors and showing His wounds to Thomas. But he doesn't go on to tell us what all those signs are because in the end, the main path to belief is really not spectacular signs because if you get a spectacular sign, we see throughout the New Testament, they always want one more, right? Just, just show me one thing. I've just seen that you fed 5,000 with one person's lunch, but I need a sign. We see that throughout Scripture. The main path to belief is not by spectacular spectacular signs, but by the Word. He says these things are written. And that's the way most of us have come to believe. 
You know, we didn't see, we didn't touch, we didn't hear. You know, or, or, or we did hear, we, we didn't see or touch, but, but we heard something. We heard a story. We heard a sermon. We heard a scripture passage. We, we heard something and, and, and we were invited to say yes. Someone called our name. There was, there was that, that sermon that that preacher preached years ago. that just spoke to our hearts. There was that Sunday school lesson. And you just, for a change, you were listening. Or I was listening as an honorary young boy, and I thought, you know, I believe this. I really do. Maybe there was a song that was sung, and the words of that song were written in such a way that it just made your heart go from icy cold to being strangely warmed, as John Wesley says. But if you need something else, something beyond the verbal, the purely auditory, you know, something more significant than the, the preacher, then that's fine too. That's sign too, says John, because Jesus will give you what you need. See, now I don't know what you need to be in full faith. I, I don't know. Maybe you don't even know what you need. Maybe what you need is for, for Jesus to come slipping through closed door behind which you're fearfully hiding. And you need to hear His words as He says to you, Peace. Peace. So don't worry if you're not the first person to know Christ. You know, faith in Christ is determined not by when you get to Him, but as He comes to you when you finally recognize it. And He will. He will come to you. If you're sitting here today and you're thinking, I'm not sure about all these things, Christ will get to you if you just will listen. Keep, keep, keep hanging on. Christ will get to you. He will. You know, that same one who danced from the grave and in that tomb and his dumbfounded disciples stumbling after him through this process. The same one who intruded through those closed, locked doors on Easter evening who pulled up his shirt and said, here's my side, stick your hand in there. Who said that to Thomas. That person who just needed a touch, that one comes to you, giving you what you need so you can believe in Him. Let me tell you, our mission here at our church is that we will be followers of Jesus. And then we will take what we learn of Jesus as the Holy Spirit fills us and we will invite others to be a part of this journey we know to be Christian faith. But you can't be a follower of Jesus, not really, if you don't believe. For some of you, this is be the thousandth time you feel like, and you just not you're just saying, okay, and that's okay, fine. I've believed all my life. For some of you today, maybe it's at a point, and maybe it's hit you differently. Maybe something's happened that feels different. Maybe there's something there that you just has brought to you in your mind some thoughts and you're thinking for a difference hey I need to believe I want to believe how can I believe then just hear God 